the positive feelings that we have toward them. Because if we can't express them, then they have to guess how you feel. And sometimes our body language sends a different message or we're so busy that we don't send a message at all, even non-verbally. And every now and then, it's a little harder for men because they're not as verbal as we are. We can, you know, we can just chit-chat. and uh, But men have a little bit more trouble and sometimes you have to put them on the spot to get them to say how they really feel. But when they will express themselves, it's very nice to hear. And you think, wow, I didn't know you thought that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's one way that we can express love one toward another. So are you awake now? Or are you going to go back to sleep on me? Some of y'all were up pretty late last night, weren't you? Yes. All right. I won't take it personally today if you fall asleep, but I might hit the podium or something to, <laughs> to bring you back. <laughs> All right, I'm ready if you guys are. We've been going, okay. Well, as you heard the message today, I think it's already been preached um, directly from the mouth of the Father. But the message today was curses, curses, wasn't it? The blessings that they read, it was a very short section. But the curses went on and on and on. And... I would like for you to, to know or to understand at least two of the kinds of curses that are in this portion. When you get into this area of scripture, eventually you're going to hit every type of curse that's mentioned in Hebrew. But I've picked out two of them because today the covenant's being renewed. It's the end of the Israelite journey through the wilderness and now they're ready to cross over, cross over the Yarden and go into the promised land. But they're being reminded of their covenant. They have a covenant, which is a little bit different than a contract because a contract's more like a business deal. But a covenant is a deal, but it's also a relationship. That's why we call marriage a covenant as much as a contract because if it's just a business deal, there's going to be some problems. It's just going to be you fulfill this, then I fulfill that, then you do this. But it's a relationship because you love one another. And at the point you cease to love one another, then it's merely a contract. And we see that happen a lot. Um, it's not always easy to keep our covenants. It's not easy to keep our agreements. Because when we first agree to make a covenant or make an agreement, it's because there's something about that deal that really looks good to us. It sounds good. Yes, I want to do that. Yes, I want to be a part of that. Yes, I would like those benefits in my life. Yeah, I think I can do that. That doesn't sound too hard. But over time, doesn't it get harder and harder and harder to keep our end of the bargain? And it's not as joyful. And after a while, it, it's not so much fun to fulfill our part of the bargain. And we begin to feel that maybe those benefits weren't everything that we thought they would be. They're not so glamorous. And at, at some point, it actually becomes work to try to keep our end of the bargain. We just have to drive ourselves and force ourselves to keep our end of the bargain. You know, I remember um, teaching school. You don't teach school because you hate children. You teach school because you enjoy children and you enjoy your subject area, right? And at the first of the year, there's all this anticipation you want to meet the new students. But after so long, it gets harder and harder to be that enthusiastic because you know them all. You know what they're going to do before they do it. You know what they're going to say before they say it. And it gets to be a grind by a certain point. Fortunately, we have little breaks in the year built in to help us refresh and so forth. And if you're really... Uh, blessed and work for a system where you can take a sabbatical, that's good too. You can refresh yourself. But over time, it's the cares of life that really encroach upon our vision. And it encroaches upon our commitment to the other party. And it takes away that first joy. And that's what's sad. When you think about when you first really understood what Torah was, and that you saw Yeshua embodied in it then, and you saw that he embodied the Torah and that it was all one thing, that it was all unified. Remember the joy you had? Remember how excited you were? You had a new toy, didn't you? But over time, it gets harder and harder and harder to maintain that first love, to maintain that first joy. 
and at some point it's tempting to let it become a heavy load to become an obligation to just go through the motions and when we get to a point where it begins to feel like that where we don't have that joy in keeping our end of the bargain and keeping our covenant we're at a crossroads and I think one of two things could happen number one we are going to do whatever it takes to renew our joy in Yeshua and we're going to come back and we're going to be stronger than ever we're going to find fresh oil and we're going to renew our love or we have another choice you get kind of bored with the relationship what happens in the natural realm when we get a little bored with our partner something called adultery right we try to spice her up well hope we don't we don't but we better not I better not hear about that but in this other realm of the world when we become bored with a commitment or a relationship maybe even with a friendship you get bored with a friend you will go out and you will seek a new friend that's a little spicier a little more upbeat a little more interesting or if you're not living by the Word of God and you're married and this person becomes boring to you not as interesting not what you thought they were then you may go out and seek someone else to initiate a relationship with it's not that you want to get rid of this one you want that one too because it's comfortable and and you know there's that aspect of it but you want to introduce some new thing to give you a little more spice to make it fun and that's what Israel did they had a husband they had a covenant they had a relationship but because it wasn't entered into with joy and gratefulness over time they became bored with it well this isn't so much fun as we thought it was let's go make a golden calf and we'll say this is the God that brought us up out of Egypt and it'll spice it up because you know there's all sorts of fun things you can do with a golden calf that you just can't do with the tabernacle let's do that or when they get into the promised land oh this is so routine let's go make some Asherah poles and set them up beside the altar of God that's spicier because they've got all these rituals you know with fertility and it won't be like we're really you know committing the sexual sins that our covenant says we should not it'll actually be a form of worship because you know God needs a wife so let's make Asherah his wife let's set up a cohort with him we're not rejecting God we're going to introduce someone else into the relationship you know that's what adultery means it means to add another to some already established relationship it just means to add something else that's what adultery is when we become bored with keeping covenant we are in jeopardy of looking out to the world to try to find someone or something to spice it up for and that's a dangerous place to be if this occurs then we will begin to neglect some of the commandments that we read and some of y'all were standing there saying amen easy <laughs> easy because what you were taking on yourself if you disobey was a curse you want to be really careful about saying amen to a curse because that realm of living is very uncomfortable as we heard it's like you're on the run all the time I think about with these people running from the hurricane good grief aren't they running seven ways I mean they go from here to Texas and then here it comes into Texas and we're running again and I don't know that that has anything to do with this but that's what Adonai says happens when we don't keep the commitment we're constantly on the run we're constantly in chaos how do we keep from doing that well, he says keep my commandments that's the difference between the blessing and the curse and not only that I want you to keep my commandments but I want you to be joyful when you do them and I might be the worst offender at doing a commandment just because I have to just because that's what he said and forgetting to put the joy into it that rightfully belongs there because when you do something over and over you tend not to think about it anymore but if you were to reflect on it and think about what a privilege it was to keep that commandment then you it would restore your joy over it it becomes rote for us he says I want you to be joyful once you've made the commitment to the covenant you did not have to say yes to this covenant nobody is forced to say yes but once you say it you're committed and you're in a more precarious spiritual condition than a total heathen that's never heard the word 
because they're standing here with the blessing and here with the cursing and everybody's hearing it and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt if you live in this realm you're blessed and if you live in this realm you're cursed and if you live over here knowing what you've heard then these curses and things sound worse than just total heathens that don't have a clue because you know too much it's going to hurt worse than if you knew nothing it'd be like Yeshua with the Pharisees he said if they didn't understand that would be one thing there'd be no sin but because they say we see and they still pursue their own path now there's sin now there's going to be misery what people don't know they don't know but once you know and you're sitting right now in a very precarious position because now you know you just sat here or stood here and listened to the blessings and the cursing now you know there's really only one choice you can make from this point on because now you know what will happen if you don't but you must do it with joy is what the commandment says we have to walk with joy and the tithe of the first fruit was connected to it because the tithe is something you bring with joy the tithe of the first fruits and you not only bring what you have in the produce you make a declaration that I have been faithful. If we had to come in here every week and declare before we dropped a coin in the box that I have been completely faithful to your covenant, how many coins would go in the box? That's a strong declaration to make. I have been faithful. I have walked to the best of my ability and been obedient. But this commitment to the covenant is... Uh, tied to the tithe of the first fruits and we can go all the way back to the beginning to Genesis to Cain and Havel Cain and Abel and we see what happens when you don't bring the first fruits and I'll finish this in a few weeks when we get back to Bereshit to Genesis I will finish this up but when you don't have the joy of bringing you will bring less than your best and that's what Cain did. It says he didn't bring the best that he had. He didn't bring the first fruits of his produce like we were commanded to. It says he just brought the fruit of the ground. He kept the best for himself. On the other hand, Havel brings the first fruits of his flock. He brings the choicest and brings it in. When you're joyful about it, you'll bring the best you have. When there's no joy, you'll keep it for yourself because you're still looking for the spice, right? Let's spice it up. The two words uh, most often used in, in scripture for a curse are arar, and you have a handout that shows you how it's transliterated and then how it's spelled in Hebrew. And the curse called the klal or the klala, you might hear it either way. And sometimes they're used interchangeably. I, I looked for a real pattern and there really isn't one that can distinguish between the two of them. But these two words, I think, will tell you what it means to be cursed. And when you're doing spiritual warfare, and trust me, you know when it's happening to you, it will help you to know what these two words mean. It will help you understand what is happening to you, why you're being assaulted, what the point of the assault is, what the enemy hopes to gain from your making the wrong choice, and what it puts you under once you make the wrong choice. We want to talk about the blessings all the time. Well, today's not about the blessing. Today is about what happens when you make the wrong choice, when it concerns your covenant. The curses can originate either from the earth, the realm of nature, which is cursed, or they can originate from men who also live under a curse. In a natural sense, we all live under a curse of death, the met. Um, we won't cover that today, but death is also a curse. And that was the curse they were promised would come upon them. They weren't necessarily told about the arar and the claw. Just when, when he put them in the garden, he says, okay, there's this one thing that you can't have. And if you eat it, you will surely die. That's a curse of death. That's nothing to do with these two things, other than these two things eventually lead to that. So in a natural sense, we all live in a, a curse of physical debilitation and death the second you were born you start dying right and in fact the whole earth lives there's something called entropy if you remember your biology class and it basically says that everything degenerates eventually and it goes away even the universe is spreading out it's going away it's dying but on the other hand this little 
earth that we live in seems to somehow live in a very delicate stasis and we talk about things like the ozone and how delicate it is yes it is it's in a very delicate state that creates conditions for life even though we live under a curse of death but I believe what holds it together I believe even the power that holds the atom together is Yeshua I don't think we understand completely how that happens but I believe he is that force and I derive this from what we read in Colossians in whom we have the redemption the forgiveness of sins and he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities remember those words rulers and authorities all things have been created by him and for him and he is before all things in front of all things and in him all things hold together even down to the smallest atom Yeshua holds it together he's also the head of the body the congregation and he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might come to have first place in everything and that's what I want you to remember. Yeshua has first place in everything because that's the position that the Father gave him. Now let's move on to the Klal or the Klala curse for just a second and then we'll go back to the Arar and I'll explain to you what that headship means. The Klala means to make light of, to diminish, to lessen, to ridicule, to make fun of, not to be taken seriously or to be considered vile. The letters of Kl Kalal or Klala lead us to believe that it's almost a way of poking at people. Have you ever had somebody that just irritated the daylights out of you? You were under a Kalal curse. <laughs> That's what they were doing. They were poking, poking, poking. And you've had students like that that just poke, 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 drive you nuts. They're not overtly trying to destroy you. It's like being nibbled to death by a duck right it's that slow drip that's the Klala curse and you can see that there's two Lamids in the claw curse and remember the the Lamid you can even tell by the shape of it it's an ox goad that's what a Lamid is and they would poke the oxen to get them back on the path or get them back in the straight line as they were plowing the fields and so if you get off track you get poked that's what the Kalal curse is. You're constantly getting poked and prodded and, and, and so forth. And really, if you will allow it to be, it can be the ox go to the Father trying to get you back onto the right path so that you can be productive. But in the hands of the enemy, it can be an object that, that's inflicting torment upon you. No matter where you go, you get poked. No matter where you turn in the Torah portion, you get poked. You can't run here. You can't run there. It doesn't matter where you go. You're poked you're diminished you're not taken seriously and the other letter is the kuf and the kuf if you look it up in Hebrew is a monkey remember remember Amalek remember the monkeys hey hey they're the monkeys and they will ambush you and they will catch the weakest among you they will cut you down from behind alright it's the same letter and a monkey simply cannot be taken seriously can any one of you watch a monkey do monkey things and not laugh at them when you're under a claw curse nobody's gonna take you seriously you won't have any respect because you're like the image of what you should be if you're not getting the respect it's because you're kind of like a monkey a monkey's not a man a monkey can only imitate a man you were created to be a full man or woman in the image of the Creator. When you live outside of the covenant, you live like a monkey. You're just imitating what you should be in Messiah. And no one's going to take that seriously. Especially if you claim to live under the covenant and you're still acting like a monkey. An ape can only ape what he sees. But it doesn't come from an end. There's no creative thought there's no real understanding I don't care how much sign language you teach them there's no real understanding in a monkey's mind it can only imitate what you teach it and so 
It's just a mirror of what we were supposed to be. We were created for Kiddushin, for holiness. That's another word that begins with the kuf. Holiness. That is taken seriously. It's the opposite of this type of curse. But a klala curse will just make you into a monkey of a man. And like an ox, you can only function the way that other people guide you. You don't know how to think independently for yourself and come up with a good result. You can't plow a straight row. You can't be fruitful. And you will not be trusted to stay on the path. You'll be off wandering in the neighbor's field looking for something to spice it up. But because of Messiah, you are heir to. You can inherit unbelievably um, a capacity to think, to be creative, to function well, to take the Word of God and to live it creatively and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When you live under a curse, you can't do that. So to be under a klala curse is very debilitating and it's going to open the door, as you heard in the scriptures, to a variety of emotional disorders. When you start getting into the, the psychology books and look at all the, the emotional disorders that are just proliferating in America, they're exactly what the klala curse is described as being. You begin to be schizophrenic. You begin to be all of these things because you're living in a realm of cursing. And the thing about the claw curse is that we are born with an innate need to belong, to be accepted, to be loved, to know that people value us and respect our opinions and our thoughts. And when you're under this curse, the irony of that is those very things that you as a human being need to feel accepted and loved and respected are the very things that are denied you. That's what it means to be under a claw curse because people are not taking you seriously. You're the monkey. Human beings need to feel as though not as they're being acted upon but as though they're acting upon other people in cooperation with other people. The claw curse cuts you off from that because then you become the victim over and over and over. Um, the cattle prod, the lamed, will tell you that. But a human being who is not taken seriously will soon develop a whole range of psychological disorders. And the total fear that accompanies it, you can hear in the curses. There's a lot of people that live in constant fear of something. That's part of a curse. Even our death, I believe, is related to the claw curse because it says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So it makes sense that the life corresponds to the blessing and the death corresponds to the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. That curse of death is claw. That diminishing, not, it will kill you. When you're not treated well, when you're not respected, when you don't belong, when you don't feel valued, it will slowly kill you. And you can see that that's the way it was about the curse of death in the beginning because he says the day you eat it, you will surely die. Well, in English, that's not a real good translation for us to read because we've got a whole lot of people running around out there that say, yeah, they ate it and they didn't die. And then we try to reason it away and say, yeah, but a day with the Lord is a thousand years and they died within a thousand years. Well, you don't have to do all that. It's much simpler if you read it in Hebrew. Uh, it's an imperfect tense. What it means is the day you eat it, you will begin the process of dying. That process had not begun in them. Once they ate it, then the clock started. Then we were on the clock, and it took some time, but they began dying the second that they ate it. Uh, the klalal curse is similar to that. It will start the clock running, and you will just start spiraling downward. It might take some time. It won't kill you all at one time. It will kill you slowly. Again, the klal is spelled with two lamids. Lamid implies teaching and instruction. Lomed is learning, right? If you're a Talmud, the root there is the Lomed, you're a learner. So it's associated with learning and teaching. The problem is 
there's only room for one teaching in your body. It can only accommodate one and function well according to the way that you were created to function. And we can see this confirmed when Yeshua says in John 7, when it was now in the midst of the feast, Yeshua went up to the temple and began to teach the Lamed. The Jews, therefore, were marveling, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? There's a second teaching you can put in your body from men, but they're saying he doesn't have this second teaching. Yeshua, therefore, answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks to his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, that's in a capital letter there, is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Someone under a claw curse has two lamets. If you live under that claw, you're living under two lamets, which is two teachings. There's only room for one if you look at Yeshua's life. He says, my teaching's not mine. It didn't come from men. It came directly from the Father above. And that's righteousness. And that's what you heard in the Haftorah portion, that righteousness will be in charge of us. When Yeshua is in charge of us, in his reign, righteousness is in charge. If there's another teaching that you're living under, you're living under a curse. Because your body was not designed to accommodate that. It will debilitate you. It will start a process of dying inside of you. Someone under a Kala curse derives that teaching from two different sources. One from the Father above and one from the serpent below. It goes back to the garden. It's like I was telling you, you take one tablet that you brought with you from Egypt and you want one tablet of the commandments and you want to stick them together and say, I now have ten commandments. You can't do that. You can't take five from here and five from here. You can't take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. There's only room for one in your life because the mixture brings on the curse. You would be better off to be the total heathen than to know what you know and start mixing it together. Now back to the Arar curse, the headship. Arar is a curse that derives from the ground, the Adama. Remember, Adam's name comes from Adama, the earth. And it's a curse under which our whole nature, including nature itself, is in bondage. Even nature is groaning under this curse, the arar. The animals are included, both clean and unclean. Doesn't matter. As well as the earth and the things that are part of the earth, including the rocks, the plants, the water, the so forth. Animal, vegetable, mineral, it's all cursed. How did this happen? Well, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed, arar, are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field? On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Well, all we knew that was coming was death, right? We knew that if we sinned, death was coming. But now we find out, oh, there's more to it. Now the animal kingdom is under a curse. The earth itself is under a curse. And then it goes on in uh, verse 17 of Genesis 3. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. I don't think Adam knew that was coming. All he knew was, okay, he said if we eat it we'll die. He knew that was coming. He did not realize, I don't think, that the very earth underneath his feet, it was all going to be cursed because of his actions. And then his son kills his other son. And Adonai says to him, to Cain, he says, Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Now not only is the ground cursed, there's actually a curse coming up from it. He says it, it's the mem. You're, it's going to come up from the ground and you're going to be cursed by it. It's just going to emanate up out of the earth. That's going to affect you. And what that did is it cut off Cain's favored source of food. Whatever you like under this curse, it's going to be cut off from you. Whatever you want the most is the very thing that you will not be able to obtain. Because he kept the first fruits of the produce for himself, now it says it's going to be even harder for you to get that food you enjoy so much. You like vegetables? It's going to be a lot harder for you to get your vegetables out of the ground. 
And that's the, the irony is when we're under an Iraq curse, we're pursuing these things we desire so much, but those will be the very things that elude us time after time. Even the curse of the woman guilty of adultery is an Arar curse from the earth. Because remember, they took the dust of the earth and they mixed it with this water and she was made to drink it. And if she had lied, if she had been unfaithful to the covenant and then lied about it, then it says it's going to cause some effects on her body. It says when he's made her to drink the water, it shall come to pass that if she's defiled and has done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thighs shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. That's an Arar curse. At first I would have thought it would have been the claw because it's the wasting away of the body, but it's the Arar because it has to do with the headship in the covenant that she's made with her husband. If she has added another head into her covenant relationship, then she falls under the curse of having two heads, which is the Arar. How do we get that? Well, look at the look at the word. It's spelled with resh, resh, aleph, resh, resh. Resh is your head, rosh, right? Well, there's only room for one head. If you have two heads, you're a monster. Imagine yourself with two heads. That would be difficult. Would you talk to yourself a lot? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you would. But it would be very difficult to function with two heads. How do you expect a marriage to function when you have this head and this head? Can you submit to both of them? No, you cannot. You've ruined the relationship. The first letter of this curse, Arar, is Aleph. Aleph, we know, is the first letter of the Aleph bait, and it means to learn as well. It means to train animals or to bring forth thousands to be fruitful. And you can see that the dual nature of that letter, whether it, it's exposing our animal nature, showing this that we're acting like a monkey sometimes, and that nature's going to have to be trained and so forth, or we can take on this other side of the olive, which is productivity, fruitfulness, goes back to the, the gift of the first fruits. We can bring forth much fruit if we will remain in the covenant. And that's what you see in the woman accused. If she's guilty, if she has adulterated that covenant, then she's going to bring forth death in her body. But if she has been faithful to the covenant, if she has kept her vows and so forth, if she's innocent, it says that she will become pregnant and bear children and potentially have thousands of descendants. And I think that's the picture of us. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to stick with the covenant? Will we do what we said we would do? Will we keep the agreements we say we will keep and therefore become fruitful? Our actions will be consistent with what we have said and what we believe. But if we've broken the commandment, if we've adulterated our covenant relationship with our husband and therefore with Elohim himself, that's why it's important in scripture and in our own lives for a woman to be faithful to her husband because it has a direct bearing on her relationship with Adonai. She relates through her husband in that way. But if we adulterate it, then we add another head. And then we have the head of the serpent to deal with. We suffer from the curse of the Arar, which is having two heads, two decision makers. Arar is spelled with two races. So the ratio is the head. It refers to your will, to your intellect. And it also can mean being first in number, being the principal or main one. Think back to Colossians where it says that Yeshua is all these things. He's the head. He's the principal. He's the beginning. He's the origin. In Him, everything was created and holds together. It's the beginning, the leader, the one who is superior. And this refers us to Messiah. A raw curse means that I'm living with two heads. I might claim Messiah is my head, but the truth is I have added another. I've listened to the voice of the serpent because there can't be two heads in one body. It says he is the head of the body. If I listen to the serpent, there's another head. I can't listen to both voices. Yeshua is the beginning. He's the authority. He's the firstborn. If you can't faithfully and joyfully carry out the commandments of Adonai, you're adding another head. You're in violation of the covenant. You're adding another. Have you, have you seen pictures of conjoined twins? 
that were joined at the head, how effective can their lives possibly be? How effective can your life possibly be if you have two heads? How far will you go? Or will you just go in circles? You have very little control over what happens to you. And that's why adultery is so often used in Scripture as a metaphor to describe faithlessness. It has a direct bearing on who your head is. We can't ignore the instructions of the covenant word through which all things are held together. You understand that your obedience to the covenant helps things hold together. Adam's obedience to the covenant he originally made helped hold all things together in a very good state. Not just good, but in a very good state. That's how your participation aids. When, when he makes covenant with you, you are helping. You are adding to that relationship faithfulness. And you are going to subject the will of your carnal mind to those commandments. But we can be like Adam. We can listen to the voice of the serpent and we can add another will, our own, how many times have you known what the Word said about the situation, yet you made the decision to follow your own will? I hate to tell you, but you just popped up another head in your body. And it didn't do you any good to have two. Two's not better. You can't say if one's good, two's better. In this case, it's not. Only one head can control your life. We are trying to avoid growing that second head. Why do you think that it said the seed that would be brought forth would crush the serpent's head. That's what it's referring to, the headship and the authority that Adam gave over to the enemy. The enemy came into this world to add another head. As long as Adam lived in obedience, there was only one head on earth because everything else was in that. But when we step outside of the commandment, step outside of the covenant, then we say yes to the snake. I believe you. And all of a sudden we have once again established Satan's authority on earth. We've allowed his head to pop up. That represents that second head. Adulterating the earth is what happened. It was adulterated. Another one was added to a covenant relationship even with the natural part of the earth. The curse that was placed on the serpent was an arar. Because as a serpent, he reared his head. He raised his head and wanted to take over the authority that only belongs to one. And that's also why our portion refers to the plagues of Egypt at the very end. It says these are going to be part of these arar and claw curses. Why? Because it said Pharaoh would not allow Israel to go and serve the Lord. Israel is called to serve one head, and it is married to one husband. Pharaoh said, I will be the second one. You will serve me, and you will be betrothed to me in my service. But Adonai says, no, you can't do that, because as long as they will obey me and serve me, I am the only husband they can have. I am the only head that can be on this body. And he delivered them when they chose that. You can't set, your set, up, set yourself up as another head. Yeshua and the Father are one. There's not two heads. There's only one head. And when we are in Yeshua as our head, who is in the Father as His head, then it is then and only then that He says He will make us the head and not the tail. You cannot make yourself the head. When your will exercises against the agreements that you've made with the Holy One, then you've set yourself up as another head and you are not in Yeshua because Yeshua is completely obedient and submitted to His head, the Father. If you can't be completely submitted and obedient to Yeshua, then you are not one. You are two. And it's only then that you're going to experience the blessings of being made into the head because you're being made into that image. You're not choosing something different. The ground is cursed because of Adam's sin. 
And that was the Arar curse. And because we are from that ground, we are from the Adama that is already cursed, then part of our nature is cursed when we are born. We already live under that. So part of the redemption of the Messiah is not just the redemption of our spirit and soul. He will also eventually redeem our bodies from this curse. And he will redeem the earth from the Arar curse that it is under. You think the earth likes living like this? That's why the rocks are going to cry out. They're going to say, hey, dummy, this is the Messiah. He came to fix us back. Please reverence him and make him your head. Forget the serpent. But we continually reject the Messiah and his headship and his authority over us. We reject the covenant relationship. If you'll notice as you're reading the prophets during the Messianic reign, it's only those nations that submit to the headship of the Messiah that are, giving the ble that are given the blessings of productivity through the rain and the productivity of the earth. From them, the curse is removed. But if you will not submit to the headship of the Messiah, it says if they will not go up, then they will get no rain. And the crops will dry up then you stay under the curse. That's the perfect picture of what I'm trying to tell you. If you are obedient and submit to his headship, then there's blessing and there's rain in its season. But if you will not submit, then you will live in constant drought because he is the head. It's also uh, the return of the Messiah that's going to cause this cursed earth to give us up. If we've already been laid in the ground, when he returns, as that curse is broken over us, the earth is going to give us up. We will come up from the curse. That part of it still has rain in our bodies. Our bodies will die. There will be decay. We will die. But Messiah will come to redeem us from that second death. And that's something I want you to remember at Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah is coming up soon. The evening of October 3rd. And the Feast of Yom Teruah corresponds directly to resurrection from the dead. It's that time of year that you need to think about resurrection. If you were asleep at Yom Teruah, it's almost too late to wake up. Because the day after, you're starting into the days of awe when all this stuff is going to come down and you are not going to be equipped to deal with it. You have had 40 days of repentance up until Yom Teruah to really reflect and get your life together and discern and to evaluate how well you are doing in the covenant so that when you bring your first fruits in at Sukkot, you can lay it down and say, I have brought the best that I could come up with. This is the very best I have to give. But if you've not already prepared for that process and begun to set the first fruits aside before Yom Teruah, you will not have it to bring. You will not know what to do. So when you hear the trumpets blow, there's really not much commanded and associated with Yom Teruah. It's to blow the trumpets, even though the rabbis say it's the shofar. It says trumpets, specifically. Those silver trumpets. Now you can blow other wind instruments because it is a day of blowing. If you have a wind instrument, by all means, blow that thing. If you have a shofar, blow that thing. I want to hear those silver trumpets on Yom Teruah. I want my joy at its highest peak at Yom Teruah because the day after is too late. That trumpet is blown to call me out of my state of sleep and my state of death. You know how you let things just slowly, the joy goes away? Not on Yom Teruah. It needs to be right up here. It needs to get your heart prepared for the joy of Sukkot because you were commanded to be joyful at Sukkot. It's going to be hard to muster that up if you don't have a heart of first fruits at Yom Teruah. If you hear that trumpet blow and it does not excite you and bring tears to your eyes and stir your spirit and bring back the joy of your salvation, I would spend between now and October 3rd on my knees asking for Him to renew the joy of my salvation so that I can enter into these fall festivals with the same joy I did the first time. That's part of keeping the commandment. He said, be joyful. 
It's just as much a commandment to serve Adonai with grateful joy and happiness as it is to honor your father and mother because he said do it with joy and happiness. So he can't make me be happy. He shouldn't have to. All the things he's given you, all the curses he's brought you out of, you can't be happy and joyful and grateful for the places that he's brought you from. What I mean, even where you have been born, can you imagine living in another country, in another place where you had never even had the privilege of hearing the word of God? You can't be grateful for that. You can find something to be grateful for that will renew the joy of your salvation. When you're ungrateful and you do not consider how far Adonai has brought you, you will begin to fall under a curse because your thoughts will lead you into disobedience. You will begin to twist righteous thinking. And this ungratefulness the portion says is what brings on the curse it says in verse 47 because you didn't serve Adonai your God with joy and gladness in your heart when you had such an abundance of everything we have everything folks there is nothing we lack there's nothing we lack and if we don't serve him with joy and with gladness now we read today what will happen we know where that ungratefulness leads. It says, Adonai will send your enemy against you and you will serve him when you are hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, and lacking everything. If you can't be grateful when he gives it to you, the consequence is he'll take it away. You will lack the very things that you have. He says, so all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you. You can't run fast enough to get away from them because you'll run into them. That's how fast the curse is until you were destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you it is just as much a commandment to be joyful in doing the commandments as it is to actually keep the commandment if you serve with grumbling you're opening that door um, to curse and you're slamming the door shut to the blessings when you take the Torah into your own hands you're growing another head you're becoming the chief of your own journey. You know, he's going to call you one time. He's going to make that offer. But he's going to give you direction thousands of times. And you're going to have to have really good hearing to hear those directions. When he says, turn here, stop here, back up, move around, climb up, go down. How can you hear that if you're grumbling? Those in the wilderness couldn't. How will you? If we are grumbling about this journey, we will not be able to be grateful and we will not hear the directions. We will be lost in the wilderness because we threw the map down and walked away from it. When it got to the joyful part, we didn't like it, slammed it shut and said, I'm done, I cannot be grateful about that. But that's part of it. If you can't be grateful, if you can't follow through, if you dare God to discipline you in the wilderness, He'll follow through. Because He can't break His own word, can He? He can't break His own word. What you will inherit instead of the blessings is the claw, the arar, curses, and He will remove from your life the very things you've been longing for. He'll remove the respect. He'll remove the honor. He'll remove the provision. He'll remove the security, the peace, the control, the righteous thinking, the ability to think clearly and creatively, the ability to eat the fruit of your own labor. It'll seem like you work and work and work and work and nothing comes in. That's part of a curse. The, if you have money, it won't bring you happiness because he'll strip that away from you. If that's the object of your joy, you will never be joyful in it because you'll never have enough. That's the curse. Dissatisfaction with our portion in the Torah, it's a very dangerous place to be. If we hear it, we don't like it, and we don't want to do it with joy, we're in a decision place. You've got two roads. You can find the joy in it, and you can live in life in blessing or you can try to spice it up some other way I'm hoping that you choose the life 
because it's the voice of the serpent that is speaking those words of discontent. They were very contented until they heard another teaching, another doctrine. Their father had said, the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And the serpent comes along and he says, well, did God really say? Let's work on our interpretation here. How can we adjust what was commandment to fit what we want to do? And he grew another head on the earth. You have to give the best of what you have with thankfulness. Your true first fruits because of the one who is the first fruits from the dead. Because he was the first fruits from the dead, you have more reason to bring with joy and gratefulness the first fruits of your labor. If you're not as joyful in the festivals as you were three years ago, you're in danger. You don't know it, maybe. You won't acknowledge it, maybe. You don't want to admit it, maybe. But if you are not as joyful about these festivals coming up as you were three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago, you're in a dangerous spot. You have some decisions to make. Because you see, the Torah hasn't changed in five years. The Father in Heaven has not changed in five years. Yeshua has not changed in five years. The festivals haven't changed in five years. They're still falling according to the calendar. What changed in the last five years? We changed. We lost our joy. We allowed that joy to be stolen from us. That promise for blessing, if we are joyfully obedient, that's not changed either. All we have to do is change our attitude. When the attitude is done with truth, that's what I read back here. When you're under the one teaching, it says it's the one who is seeking the glory of the Holy One who sent Him. He is true. And there is no unrighteousness in Him. The true teaching, the true doctrine comes straight from the Torah. That's where it comes from. You have to have the joy in that because that's not changed. It will still bring you blessing if you have the joy. But if you've become ungrateful for the gift of the living Torah, you can't blame it on the woman that God gave you. And you can't blame it on the serpent. You will still have to pay for it yourself. The serpent pays his own price, right? For sin. But you are going to have to pay yours if you listen to it. If you listen to the discontent, there is a price to pay. It says, Because you didn't serve Adonai, your God, with joy and gladness in your heart when you had such an abundance of everything, Adonai will send your enemy against you. You better get happy. Ungratefulness is the beginning of curses, whether it diminishes us, depletes us, makes us a mockery, steals the things we work so hard for, you know, we should be a grateful people. Remember the supernatural act of God that brought you out of the belief system you were in and opened your eyes to what the Torah truly is. If you can't be grateful for that, you're in danger. Your spirit should be moved with joy as you prepare your heart for the resurrection. The resurrection of your spirit in the body of Messiah. Release from the curses. Because it says the alternative for being grateful is that you will be such a miserable person you can't even sell yourself to a miserable person you can't give yourself away to a miserable person I'll be your slave no I don't want you you're more miserable than I am and I'm miserable that's what Egypt means Mitzrayim misery if even miserable people don't want you around you're under a curse and he says this is what will happen if you don't keep my commandments with gratefulness and joy and if you want to know how to find the joy and you're not sure how, it's like, how do I make myself happy? How do I make myself joyful? Here's what Yeshua says. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. 
There's one head. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me. You can do nothing. Gee, didn't he just repeat himself? There's only one head. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, the one teaching, not the doctrine of the serpent, not the discontent of the serpent, not the twisting of God's word by the serpent, but the one word that Yeshua heard from the Father, if those words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Here's the key. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. If you want to be joyful, love people. He says that your joy may be full. If you're depressed, if you're unhappy, if there's no joy in these commandments, if you're dreading the festivals and already prophesying rotten fruit over them, what does he say do? Love one another that your joy may be made full. You want your joy back? Go love somebody doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they say and do. That's not what it means to love someone. Love does not mean agree, even though children think it does. You tell them no, and what they hear is, I hate you. They're, our minds transform no into you're not loved, you're not valued, you're not accepted, and all these things, and we have to work with people to help them understand no does not mean I don't love you. Sometimes no means I do. Love people convey to them good things. Whether it's things you can do in the physical realm, you can love them physically, you can enable them physically, you can give them an encouraging word. The greatest thing about you is, man, I appreciate it when you do. You are such a help to me when you let them know they're valued. Let them know they're respected. Let them know they belong. Love them. Don't wait for someone to come love you because that's not what the commandment says. It says you love one another. That means if you've just heard this, you're responsible. It is not where you sit and you wait and say, well, somebody pretty soon will come tell me something good. No, that means you get up off your hind end, you get up and you go tell them something good. That's what Yeshua said. It's your responsibility to fulfill the commandment with joy. He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you, I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. You should go and bear fruit. You don't wait for somebody to bring the fruit to you. Go do it. Whatever you ask in my Father's name, He'll give it to you. Why? Because you're praying according to His will if you're keeping His covenant. This I command you that you love one another. Just done a, do a word search in your concordance or if you've got Bible works, type in the phrase love one another and see how many times it comes up. You'll be astonished how many times we're commanded to love one another because that is the thing that renews our joy. That's what does it. If you don't love one another, your joy will never be full. You have to love one another with the same passion that Yeshua showed us when He laid down His whole life for us and He didn't even know us. People He'd never met. He loved them enough to lay down His life. You have to love one another with that same passion because that's what you agreed to. You signed the agreement. If you were in Yeshua and I'm saved, you signed the agreement. You said, I will. You said, I do. I want this to be my husband. Don't violate that agreement or you fall in jeopardy. If you don't love one another, you'll quit producing fruit. You'll cast your fruit before it's time. If you don't love one another, you've grown another head and you've latched on to a second teaching. There's only room for one head in your life and one teaching. That's it. It won't accommodate two. And the curses will be worse on us than people who don't know any better. 
There's no amount of Torah keeping that's going to save you if you don't acknowledge your salvation and do it joyfully and with gratefulness. If you don't do it with gratefulness and joy, then you have chosen disobedience to a direct commandment that you were given today. If you set up the altar of your own bitterness, anger, envy, strife, whatever it is, beside the altar of Yeshua, you've set up an Asherah pole. You've set up a golden calf and you said, I will serve this God as well as this one. It won't work. It'll work worse. There has to be submission to the commandment. There has to be love to your brothers and sisters living in covenant. Because if you keep the first fruits of even your love to yourself, you're no better off than Cain. You're living under a curse and you're cursed from the ground. Because Yeshua's calling is a much higher calling. He demonstrated love. So you get to decide today whether you want the blessing or the curse. If you want the blessing, love one another. If you want the curse, keep the first fruits of your love to yourself. Don't jeopardize your almighty ego by opening yourself up again to be hurt. But if you want to be like Yeshua, you will open yourself up to be hurt again because you love one another. When those trumpets blow at Yom Teruah, you will know what you have chosen. There will be no mistaking. When you hear those trumpets blow, you will know in your heart whether anyone else can see it or not. Each one of you will know what you have decided to do. And so I'm asking you, when you come to that service, come joyfully. Please, come joyfully. Come with a shout. The blowing is equivalent to the shout. Be prepared to shout with joy. If you've got an instrument, if you've got a trumpet, if you've got a trombone, a saxophone, whatever you have that will blow, bring it and blow it with joy over the good things, the blessings that are coming down the pike. You see, Israel didn't go out of Egypt with nothing. They went out with silver and gold and their possessions and their sons and their daughters and their old people. Yeah, there will be plagues that we'll have to live with as long as the earth is under the curse. But He will bring us out. If we choose Him and choose His covenant, He will bring us out in a very good condition. Not just good, but very good. Decide before it gets to Yom Teruah that you're ready to be resurrected. You want to hear that awakening blast. Wake up. I'm going to have surgery that morning. And I doubt if I can make it through a service. But if I've got to talk those twins into coming into my front yard Monday night and blowing those trumpets, I want to hear it. I want to hear it more than I want to hear anything else in the world on that day. Because that's the commandment, to hear the trumpet. Hear something today hear one thing today love one another so that you can have joy when you fulfill these commandments